Hi everyone, welcome to Home Church. So glad that you're joining us today. It's just you and me as over the next few weeks we're going to be moving everything into our new building in Red Deer, which is so exciting. Uh, but I got a great message prepared for you. And of course, even talking about the new building, today was an exciting day. And this week's been exciting as the orange construction fence got moved. The sound system is going in. The school is going in next week. So I want to say thank you so much for your giving. And if you haven't had a chance yet, would you sponsor me for the Run for Legacy? Uh, it's going to be so exciting on September 23rd, and we're raising money for the building and for the kids part of the building, all the slides and all the fun, and I'm going to be running for Legacy. So thanks for being a part of that. And of course, all the ways to give are on our website, on our app. Thanks for being a part. Well, today we're going to go to Ephesians chapter 1 and Psalms chapter 18. We'll start in Psalm 18. As for God, His way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust him. For who is God except the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? It is God who arms me with strength and makes my way perfect. He makes my feet like the deer and sets me on high places. And then Ephesians chapter 1 says, The church you see is not peripheral to the world. The world is peripheral to the church. The church is Christ's body in which he speaks, acts, and which he fills everything with his presence. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word today. I pray it would bring life and hope and healing and strength. And Father, cause many to follow you in even a deeper way and a greater capacity. I thank you for it, praise you for it in Jesus' name. And you can say with me, amen. Well, we're starting a new series today entitled, A Better Way. And it really came out of this last little season of our lives. Uh, my wife and I, we just got back from vacation, but it was a really different vacation because my daughter, Ava, moved to Texas before the vacation to go to school. And then Levi, at the end of the vacation, moved to Texas uh, to do an internship there. And so we just got home. And of course, with my daughter moving away to Texas, I've just made a decision this year I'm not cheering for the Cowboys. I cannot cheer for the Cowboys if my daughter is in Texas. No Cowboys, Ava. And uh, also did something preemptively. I bought a hat that says, dump him on it. And so when the day comes, I will wear the hat, and I hope he's a really good guy and can put up with some of my antics and fun, but I will probably wear that hat. And then, of course, I got a scripture for him as I'm going to read it with the dump him hat. There is a path that seems right to a man, but ends in death. That will be the scripture that I read. And of course, uh, I'm kidding, but as we sent our kids off to Texas to really begin a new chapter or part of their lives, uh, it was wonderful to, to take those moments and just see my kids and what God has done in our family, in their lives, as both Levi and Ava, Jude and Matthew as well, they love Jesus, they love their mom, they love me, they love their brothers. Um, and the brothers love Ava, and of course, they love their church. We never had to force them to come to church. We never had to plead with them. We never had to, you know, pull them out of bed because I'm so thankful to be part of such a, a wonderful church. But all of this just leads me to say what I've seen in their lives and the fruit of their lives is this, that I've never been more convinced of the vision even talking about my kids, I'm getting a little water. Water is coming out of my eyes, but I've never been more convinced of the vision. The family, the church, and the school working together to raise the child. And if your child isn't in our school, we have Destiny Christian School, of course, it's the church working together with the family. And I just want you to know that we're your best ally, the church, the pastors, the leaders, for your marriage, for your kids, for your teens. We're on your side to lead our families and your family and my family together to be worshipers of God, to know God, but into this best life 
that is ahead of us, the better life. And we're allies to you. And I, I've never been more convinced also of this, that God's way is the best way to live. And of course, you can live in sin, but then you can live in salvation. You can live in offense or you can live in forgiveness. You can live in bitterness or healing. You can live in chaos or the peace that passes all understanding. You can live under curses or you can live in the blessing. You can live with no moral standards or you can live God's way, which is the best way. You can live with this function or you can live in functional relationships because God's way is the best way and it's not a theory as I've even been speaking about my children and I could speak even more about our marriage and our life and serving Christ. It's not a theory, it's a testimony. Living in the blessing of God, living for the generations because I truly am convinced that God's way is the best way. I was talking with an awesome man in our church this week and we we're just kind of discussing some of these and and Mike Bolton said this. He said, the best argument for God is that living his way would still be the best way to live even without him. Which is impossible to do without the grace of God. But if you could live God's way without him, you would live a better life than if you just lived your own way. Now this doesn't mean that life isn't hard. It doesn't mean that, that we don't live in a, a, a broken world and that there's tragedy in our lives but through it all, God's way is better. Jeremiah chapter 29, it talks about how he has a plan to prosper us, to see us be successful, to give us a hope and a future even if we're living in Babylon or in the world. There's a hope and a future for us. And so next week, we're going to talk about the better way for your family. And in weeks to come, we'll talk about the better way for your life. But today, I want to talk about the better way and talk about... God's church because I'm convinced of this as well. I'm convinced that the church is the hope of the world. In the church, there's hope for families. There's hope for sanity. There's hope for a good future. There's hope for friendship. And of course, there's hope for eternity with Christ. And as I'm talking about the church, I want you to know I'm not saying that the church is perfect. In fact, I'm a part of the church, so immediately the church isn't perfect. You're a part of the church, so the church isn't perfect, and we bring our problems into the church often, but uh, I'm not also saying that people in the church are better than other people. I'm not saying that there hasn't been issues in, in the church worldwide or in every single local church. We really need grace because the church is part it's filled with human beings. I'm not saying that the church will always get it right and have all the answers because it really doesn't. I, I'm not saying that you should trust everybody in church. Don't leave your wallet on the seat. Don't leave your purse on the seat. Don't leave your jacket on the seat. You don't know who's in church and who might, you know, have something going on in them that they, and you know, I always get just like a little bit, concerned when people go into business together in the church without contracts and things like that? No, do things the right way. Uh, so I'm not saying that you should trust everyone in the church. I'm not saying that worship will always be great and good and perfect. Sometimes we got a sound man that's running it for the very first time. And, and how many are you thankful for all the volunteers? Can I get an amen for that today? That serve in the church, and sometimes they're serving for the first time. So I'm not saying that church life is going to be perfect all the time. I'm not saying it's perfect. But what I am saying is that despite the church's imperfections, I believe the church is God's vehicle to bring the kingdom of God to the earth. What I am saying is that throughout my life, I have seen so much more good from the church that comes out of the church than even the negative things that I have seen. 
I've seen people come to Christ. I've seen people come out of drug life. I've seen people come off the streets. I've seen people's lives totally changed. I've seen marriages restored, families healed, bodies healed. I've seen people find order in their lives and value in their lives and purpose in their lives. And, and I've seen a place where the word of God works on us and we all are changed from glory to glory day by day, week by week because of the church. And who I am, all of who I am is because of the church. We are who we are because of the church. And I like to say it like this, Jesus saved me, but the church raised me. And so I am convinced more than ever in the church. And I'm convinced that the church is the hope for the world. And so I want to give you four reasons why I believe that. Number one reason is the generational and geographical magnitude of the church. You know, at the time of Christ, I mean, Christianity just started with just a few, a few broken people, really. And in a matter of 300 years, it had grown uh, substantially to over 5 million people, and, and it was influencing the world and the Roman Empire. 2,000 years later, the National Congregational Study says that, that there are over 380,000 Christian churches in the United States. I wish I had it for Canada, but 380,000 Christian churches. Over 3 million Christian churches worldwide. Of course, there's churches in every nook and cranny of some countries. We'll never know that exact number, but there is at least that many. Some people say up to 20 million, but I don't know that. And, and if you think about it like this and just put it into another context, it seems like there's Starbucks everywhere. You know, you're driving, there's a Starbucks. You're driving, there's a Starbucks. You're driving somewhere else, there's a Starbucks. And there's 16,000 Starbucks in the United States, and uh, 35,000 Starbucks in the world, but that compares to 3 million Christian churches in the world. So oftentimes you're watching the news or you're in a conversation and you might feel like the Christian world or the church is declining. But the reality is that I've never been in a time when people are more hungry for God. And, and if you really look at the statistics around the world, the church is growing. In fact, this week, just seeing hunger in people that I met in the four or five conversations I had with people I'd never met before about Christ, people just saying, I need God, can I come to church with you? And now they say that there are 2.6 billion Christians worldwide, which was mid-2023, and since that, just since that time, that's right, right now, but since last year, almost half a billion more believers than last year. It's amazing to see what is happening, and you can put in other comparisons of 1.4 billion vehicles in the world, but 1 billion more cars than vehicles in the world. More, more than a billion cars. 1 billion more Christians than vehicles in the world. And so when you travel, and as I have, travel to the Philippines, many countries in Central America, Australia, Africa, and you see the church alive, thriving, people coming to Christ, people's lives being totally changed by Jesus and his church, you realize that the presence of the church transcends institutions, any corporation, any franchise, any people group, any government. And so sometimes we might go to the same church, and if you're part of home church, um, in all our locations, that could be a different size about 121 locations in 14 countries. Some of the churches are very small. Might be 50 people, might be 100 people, might be 200, might be 2,000 people. But we see it in this context of the people that we see every week and where we go every week. And that's the framework of our minds is just maybe the church that we go to or the city that we're a part of. But God's church is so much more vast, diverse, generational, and global than we can possibly know. And there's a hungry world right now, and I believe that in the next years to come, the church is gonna trend more and more and more because there's a hunger for God. Number two reason, 
the church is the hope of the world, is the greatness of the gospel. The world provides temporary hope, but only the gospel provides enduring hope. The hope that is beyond ourselves, the hope that is despite ourselves, hope that's sustainable in the good days and the bad days, in the valley, on the mountaintop, peace we can't even understand, joy in our suffering, strength in our weakness. It's the good news that we can live without guilt or condemnation. We don't have to be chained to our past because of the greatness of the gospel. Of course, we love the scriptures. John 3, 16, God so loved the world, he gave his only son. Whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And the good news is that God became a man in Jesus Christ, lived the life we should have lived, died a death we should have died in our place. Three days later, he rose from the dead, proving he was the son of God, forgiving us of all our sin, offering the gift of salvation and eternal life through his name to anyone who will believe. And so I'm a sinner, but because of the cross, because of the grace of God, because of forgiveness, I'm a new person in Jesus. The old is gone, the new has come, and it's an unmatched greatness of the gospel that Jesus saves me, regenerates me, gives me a new life, and I'm resurrected and to become uh, more like him every single day which means that there's hope for you. And which means that there's hope for your family and hope for your city and hope for your nation and hope for your world because of the greatness of the gospel. Number three is the unparalleled wisdom of Judeo-Christian values. This is so important because God has a better way, the best way for us to live is his way. And with all that we've been through and what I'm seeing and sensing and hearing, from young people especially, is a desire for sanity and a desire for stability that comes from doing things God's way. Young people are seeing the wreckage and the ruins of of when the world goes its own way. But our values of Christian faith will become even more and more attractive as people see the ancient wisdom and godly wisdom. Proverbs chapter one, verse seven. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And that knowledge isn't just knowledge of biblical things or or faith-related things. The fear of the Lord is the foundation of knowledge, of every kind of knowledge, scientific knowledge, educational knowledge, building things, making things. And so as we go God's way, it's the beginning of knowing how to do life not only in the ways of work but also the ways of our family and raising our kids And having good, solid relationships with others. So this Judeo-Christian life is so important. Of course, Judeo-Christian is the term used to describe the teaching of both Judaism and Christianity. Our Old Testament is, is really their Hebrew Bible. It's the same text with the same values. Margaret Thatcher said, the truths of Judeo-Christian tradition are infinitely precious, not only because they are true, but because they provide the moral impulse which alone can lead to the peace in which we all long. Even peace in the world comes through doing things God's way. Now, I already told you the greatness of the gospel, but if there was ever a time to teach our children Christian values, Today is the day. If there was ever time to teach our kids, the time is now. The world is is unstable. It's misguided. It's upside down. It's unsustainable. It's lost its way. The world just doesn't work. And we can see it. Growing up as as a pastor's kid in a Christian home, sometimes I would wonder and think, like, are Are we the inferior ones? Are we the not smart ones? I've come to think the opposite way, that the world is upside down, and God's way is by far the better way. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, there's a path before each person that seems right. Sometimes what the world teaches and speaks and says, it seems right, but it leads to death. Many people would think that the church is all fluff and no substance, 
But the more the world moves away from the Judeo-Christian view, the more broken and dysfunction the world becomes. The hope the church provides is not just for eternal life, but for you and for the world to have a better life. And we should be confident and hold our heads high that as we trust God and obey him and live in his ways, that life will be better, that God has a plan, he has a future, he has a hope for us as it says in Jeremiah 29. So as we talk about this, here's a list of some of the Judeo-Christian values. Well, here they are really quickly. Well, there is one God. God created the world and everything in it. Human beings are created in the image of God, and so there's a value for human life. And ethnicity and race have no bearing on a person's significance. We're all made in the image of God, equal before him. The nuclear family is the foundation for society. A man and a woman living in covenant, having children. It's God-ordained, and it's God's way. Number five, without God, there are no moral truths, only opinions. And so God's way is actually what becomes inside of us, the law of God written inside of us. And so we know as we go through life because of the Holy Spirit, because of our conscience, oh, that isn't right. And we have a conscience on the inside of us. Number six, we are a product of original sin, which is so important. You might say, why do you have to say that? Because Adam and Eve sinned that That root of sin comes down through the generations. Really, when you get down to it, we're not good. And that's why we need rules and boundaries and the ways of God and the the path of God to keep us like a compass. It keeps us on the right path because left to himself, man is not good without God. The world functions, number seven, to the, to the divine order, and people benefit to the extent that we live with that order. And so obedience equals blessing in our life. And just like a good parent would set up boundaries for the safety of their child, where to go, where not to go, who to hang out with, who not to hang out with, no cowboys, Ava. Those boundaries actually keep us safe, and that's love. And that's the better way. And our book, the Holy, Spirit, the Holy Scriptures, produces the best life possible as we live his ways. And that's why it says in Joshua chapter 1, 8, study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night and be sure to obey everything in it. Only then will you prosper and be successful. Would you just even say it to yourself right now? The better way. The better way is God's book. The better way is God's way. What's amazing about God is that even though he gives us a better way, he gives us this thing called free will, free choice. We can go the other ways, and you have every option and every opportunity to go whichever way that you want. But if you choose his way, he says, I've come that you would have life, and life to the full. The thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. That's the world's way, but God's way is a way of life. And number four reason why the church, I believe, is the hope of the world is that God chose the church to expand his kingdom on earth. The church isn't my idea. The church is God's idea. The church is not the kingdom. The church is the chosen instrument to carry the kingdom. It's his body, his bride, his army, his family. And I'm convinced more than ever that the church is the hope of the world. I'm convinced more than ever of the vision of the church. Families coming together to raise their kids in God's ways. I'm convinced more than ever that it's the greatest way to live. Like Jesus said to Peter, he said, Peter, upon this rock, I'll build my church. In other words, he was bringing Peter in to the equation of being part of the church and also being a leader in the church. And upon this rock, I'll build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. We get to be a part of expanding the kingdom. And that's why we're building a building here in Red Deer to expand the church, to see it grow, to see it flourish, then to expand it even into more places all around the world as we're already in 121 locations, but also to be a blessing to the big C church all around the world. And 
even in our community, I encourage our church to reach out their hand to every church as they drive by. And you might, you know, go from seeing Starbucks, how many Starbucks there are, to how many churches there are, that you can reach out your hands and pray a prayer of blessing because together we are the church of Jesus Christ expanding the kingdom of God on earth. And that kingdom of God is, of course, salvation, but the kingdom of God is also a better life because God loves us that much. So I want to pray for you today. I want to pray. If you would like to give your life to Christ, that's a great beginning. Say yes to Jesus because of the gospel. And what the gospel will do in your life, you'll go from an old man to a new man, a new woman in Christ Jesus when you say yes to Jesus and then you get into the word of God and you let it go deep into your heart and you're changed day by day and your life becomes better and better and becomes more full of purpose than ever. Would you pray this prayer with me and just say, Lord Jesus, thank you that you died on the cross for me, rose again, that I can have new life. Give me that new life now. Would you pray this prayer as well? Lord Jesus, thank you that you made a better way, a new and living way. Jesus, today, I want to live your way. I turn from sin. I turn to you. I turn from my path, and I turn to your path. I thank you for it today. Give you all the glory and the praise. Help me to be planted and rooted in your house and in your church to see your church move forward and expand the kingdom of God in the earth. Give you all the thanks in Jesus' name, and we all said, amen. Well, these are the most exciting times in our church history, as in just a few weeks, we will move into our new building. If you're part of the Red Deer area, would you come and be a part? If you're close to one of our other locations, would you come be a part of what I'm convinced is the most powerful, incredible organism on earth, the church. Love you, bless you, have a great week. We'll see you real soon.